Hey everyone! Welcome to episode two of the Interdisciplinary History Podcast. I'm your co-host Victoria. And I'm still Sloan. And today we're going to be doing a very interesting episode about working in a library during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, so episode two, pretty exciting to be on to our second one. It might actually be better to call this episode 2A because we have another episode coming out in a couple of weeks that's going to be very similar. What we've done is we've reached out to the QN library and we got a really good response from faculty. So we had planned this episode around having one, maybe two interviews. We've got five different faculty members who are going to come and talk to us. So you're going to hear from two of them today. And then next week, we're going to have two more for you. And then we're going to have a discussion with uh, a professor as well. Today, we'll be having two very interesting interviews with Robin Hall and Val McLean from McEwen University's library. And this is going to be part of an ongoing series we're going to be discussing, which is essentially how life in academia has changed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. With ours, this is going to be a bit more in relation to say, library sciences this episode. But the next couple episodes, we're going to see a little bit more librarians. And then lastly, we're going to have a very interesting talk with one of our professors at the university. And it'll be nice to hear all these different sides in relation to how the transition to the online world has gone along with the digital humanities. But that's going to be a later episode. So stay tuned for that. It'll be a good fun. All the people we've interviewed so far are so lovely, and I think that shows in Avala and Robin were so kind, and they were so patient with us, because this was our first interviews that we've done for this podcast. I think it's it's a start of something awesome. What about you, Sloan? Yeah, I'm very excited by everything that we heard. I'm excited for our listeners to get to hear uh, sort of the perspective. Uh, This episode, I think we've got a really good pairing because we are going to start with uh, Robin Hall, who specializes in sociology and gender studies um, as a library and infotech science professional. So that's going to be very cool. And then we've got Val McLean, who is the archivist as well as the librarian for humanities. Uh, So it's super exciting. I just want to say before we play the interviews, uh, for you listeners to hear. Thank you a disclaimer and a huge apology to Robin Hall for the quality of the audio that ended up being pulled from the recording. I've done my very best to clean it up as much as I can. I'm so sorry, Robin, that there is a little bit of clarity, a little bit of difficulties hearing some of what you've said. I had attempted to split the recording between what was coming through in the call and what was going into my own mic, and all of my own audio was also lost. So I've had to go back and re-record myself with what I think I was asking you. I didn't speak much in this interview, so that's good. But there is a little bit of, I was paraphrasing myself in what you're hearing in the final product. You, Robin, you were our, kind of our guinea pig for me recording through the screen. So that's where it came in. Uh, listeners, you'll notice a pretty distinct difference between when we get to Vala's interview. It's cleaner and crisper, and that is what this podcast quality is going to be like moving forward. So uh, thank you again, Robin, for being understanding about this, hopefully. And we can really appreciate you being our first interview and kind of allowing these things. Yes, thank you both to Val McLean and to Robin for interviewing us. Uh, As a small podcast, it means so much that we're getting people who have really, really uh, important jobs in the faculty at McEwen University to talk with us and have these really important discussions. I'm I think that this episode has a lot of valuable information. So we're going to play both interviews for you. At the end, Victoria and I have some thoughts that we'll share. Let's get into it. Roll recording. Okay, welcome Robin to the show. Thank you so much for meeting with us. Uh, Shall we just jump right in? No, I think that sounds good. Um, Unless you want to just introduce myself. Yeah, I think that would be great. Um, so my name is Robin Hall, and I'm the scholarly communications librarian at McKean University, which means that I help faculty and students with publishing and disseminating research, creative works, and other things. And I'm also the liaison librarian for sociology and the gender studies minor, and we've been at the university since 2012, so eight years. I think that's it. <laughs> All right. 
That's awesome. Yeah, so a big part of scholarly communications is trying to help faculty members find ways to make their research as openly available as possible so that other people can actually read it, engage with it, not just other faculty members that work at universities with lots of money to subscribe to their stuff. Um, cause, uh, these resources are crazy expensive, and it is unfortunate that so many members of the public don't have access to research results that they could be using and engaging with. So, always trying to find new ways to help people uh, share the different types of work that they're doing as broadly as possible. Um, and I do a lot of work with students as well to put their stuff out there. We host a few student journals that can publish open access works. Uh, one is the McKinney University Student e Journal which is up and functioning right now and accepting uh, submissions from students, upper level students at McKinney and the new time. And we also have a research repository, which aims to make everything disseminated, everything created by people at the institution openly available. So again, there are tons of student work in there, even this coursework that uh, faculty members have deemed to be amazing, uh, and, then, and also open access versions of faculty work as well. So. It's definitely a huge part of my job, and now especially when we're living in an online environment, I think that that open accessibility of knowledge is critically important. Yeah, that was uh, one of the things I was thinking about with the with the whole pandemic is would more of this academic research be available to the public? And you've sort of answered that already for us is that it's sort of becoming more common with our online environment. Yeah, definitely, especially with medical research. There's a lot more um, what are called preprints, which are original drafts of research before they go through peer review, being put into preprint repositories. And we've seen those talked about a lot in the news for better and for worse. Uh, since they haven't gone through any sort of peer review process yet, they may not be the most reliable, but we're in one way in the world where we're trying to get results out as quickly as possible. I think that those early results are important to share. So. And even like with student research day that we always do in April, it was canceled this year, and so we made a big push to get student work that would have been presented in person up in our repository to share that out, so that students could have something that they could, you know, that would show what they've done in their course work and elsewhere, just to disseminate that out further. So definitely important stuff to think about. Although there's still a lot of people that don't publish open access just because of academic norms and, you know, the biggest, most well-known journals typically aren't open access and they still want to get their stuff published there. So it's trying to break down some of those barriers slowly but surely. Oh, absolutely. And has it been challenging to offer the same level of research help and support because you're being kind of limited by the digital necessities of COVID? Not so much at McKeown, we're quite lucky that we have access to a lot of stuff online already, and we're actually one of the only libraries in Western Canada that's fully open right now. Um, a lot of libraries are letting people in by way of making appointments and scheduling when they're going to be on campus, but our doors are open to anybody who wants to come in. And saying that, we are following all our data health guidelines and we're doing counts of how many people are there at all times, and everyone has to wear a mask, and there's plexiglass up, and there's hand sanitizer everywhere, but um, I think access is still really good. Um, but, you know, COVID-19 is definitely putting additional pressure on budgets, and I'm sure there will be more cancellations moving forward as well, so access is always something you have to keep in mind, and, and that goes cutting out new ways of providing access is critically important, whether it's through supporting open access or partnerships with other institutions and doing more intro library learning and that sort of thing as well. Yeah, because I was wondering how it was going over at the McEwen Library with uh, all the COVID protocols, because I haven't been in since, gosh, I think March. Yeah, it's, we were shut down for a while completely, and that was really a struggle, because we had to quickly figure out how we could make things available to people that wouldn't be available online, so we started at the scan on the main service, so within the boundaries of copyright, we could at least scan a portion of the books that we have on the shelf and share a PDF version of that, and that service is still available for people that don't want to actually come in, but we are definitely open now. Um, and we have a new service also called um, a checkout, the checkout app that's on our website. So if you come in and you don't want to talk to anybody, you can download this app onto your phone and it will check out books for you by taking a little picture. I've used that and it's kind of nice too if you want to maintain distance from all other individuals. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that that's an option for people, especially I, I'm a 
bit of a germaphobe myself. So like hearing that that is an option, that makes me feel really, really happy and safe. And the folks are being quarantined for 72 hours, which isn't great for people who have access to stuff. It's very consuming a bit, but again, we're following guidelines, and so they sit on the shelf for 72 hours before they go back out. Yes, and I think that's been one of the side benefits most of COVID is that we have to rethink those services, and we're always trying to expand our online services to meet the needs of more of our users. We don't want to be exclusively online, obviously, because that does not meet everybody's needs. There's definitely things that are only available in physical format, but um, we do want to keep looking at our scan on demand service in ways that we can expand it out. Uh, something that we're looking at is called controlled digital lending, which is where we can scan an entire book and then share that with just one other person in the same way that we would lend out a physical copy. There are copyright considerations around this. It's not straightforward at all, but quite a few libraries are looking at how they can make that happen. Um, we do order ebooks whenever possible. We are ebook preferred and we have been for quite a few years just because it's more accessible to everybody that way. But there's still publishers that don't make things available electronically, and so we, we definitely are trying to figure out more ways to make stuff available electronically where we can within the boundaries of the law. Uh, one problem we've had though is with textbooks, we can't. There's absolutely no way to do that. The textbook publishers are really adamant about making their money <laughs> from our that's been a struggle, and it's a heartbreaking struggle. And um, I talked about open access. One well, other part of my job is open education resources, and that's trying to get my faculty to move to what are called open textbooks, which are freely available online textbooks, and providing services to get more of them developing their own as well. So that's another big push that I'm hoping we'll see more of that and here moving forward. Just because, um, yeah, these resources are crazy expensive across the board. They are. I uh, I was in one class and I think I spent about 300 on books alone and it was just insane. Yeah, I and mean, that's, you don't always end up reading the textbook when you pay that much and oftentimes you can't resell it because then we move to another new edition and we have a lot of stuff through the library that is comparable to the stuff. So if an instructor, instead of using a textbook, used a whole bunch of book chapters and articles and made all of those available through Blackboard instead of the textbook is something we encourage people to do too if there isn't an open access version of a textbook that could work. So yeah, I'd encourage students to be vocal about that kind of stuff if, if it is costing you too much money to buy all of your resources. Let your instructors know too. Because there's definitely support available to help them try to identify some alternate. Yeah, I, I think that's awesome. And I thank you for doing that. You and all, and the other librarians for reaching out and doing that for students. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Um, we do have a textbook collection, but it's costing us so much money to maintain it. But at least there is at least one copy of each required textbook that's over a certain amount um, for all of the courses that we can. So people who are desperate can still come in and, and check those out for short term. I was very excited when you agreed to be on the show, Robin, uh, because we are trying to be interdisciplinary in our approaches, and you are the librarian who specializes in sociology and um, the gender studies money here at McEwen. The social sciences obviously being a place that history has borrowed a lot from and gained a lot from in terms of methodology and source material and practice. I'm curious if there's any challenges to accessibility you're finding specific to the discipline of sociology, say. Well, I work with sociology and a lot of the resources that they use are already online because it's really article-based at the end of the day. But they, I can say that the usage on our ebooks has gone way really up since March, which is great because we were paying for all of this stuff. It is available, but you know that tells me that people are starting to dig in and explore more of those things as well and um, expanding into more of, of those resources. If you walk into the library, at the queue when you go upstairs, those books that are on the shelf are a tiny fraction of everything that we actually have available. So, so I hope students are really taking the time to look more closely at what's there. I will say I've not been brought into classes as frequently this term, so I'm a little worried that students don't necessarily know all the things, because that's part of my role when I come into the classes to promote relevant databases and, and stuff like that. So we'll see how that goes moving forward, but um, 
know, yeah, there's definitely lots available, and I'd encourage everybody to really dig into the library website and get the full scope of what's actually available for us. There's lots of stuff that doesn't necessarily come through in any library search that is in all of our databases that we have available and, and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. And I will say, even though my instruction has gone down a little bit this term, uh, the amount of students contacting us through our online chat service for research help has remained really consistent. And, and people are coming forward asking questions about what's a suitable resource and how to do appropriate searching. And I've definitely been hearing from students over email and doing research consults like this using Google Meet uh, and helping people. And so, yeah, it's been working. I'm glad people are just still reaching out and asking for help, even if they're not necessarily on site to get that in-person support. It feels a little odd and maybe even a little wrong to look for a silver lining in COVID, but is it fair to say that students are maybe gaining some skills or engaging with some research practices they might not otherwise have out of necessity right now? Yeah, it does. I've heard that we've heard from a lot of students that they don't necessarily know what they're looking at all the time. Like, is this the scholarly peer-reviewed article or something else? And we've been trying to develop more resources on our end to actually help people understand the differences because a lot of times in assignment we'll just say, use academic sources. What does that actually mean? What does that include? and not include, so trying to help with that sort of literacy and building that out is definitely really important, and that's part of the library instruction that we do with students in the classroom, that you're putting together asynchronous materials to support classes with more advanced research skills. I think for students around the world, the biggest issues are with trying to navigate just learning in an online environment, and, and we both can probably speak to this too, but, you know, sitting through online lectures instead of being in the classroom, trying to do online discussions, trying to do group projects in an online environment and trying to do certain groups in an online environment and adapting to all of these different platforms. I think we're all having to expand our digital literacies and, and working in those sorts of environments and getting used to having people in our homes basically while we're working, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like my sister, she's she's in her first year at university and she says she this is definitely not what she was expecting because it's a whole different environment there's uh, working from home adds a whole different element of distraction into the mix so i think that that's something i notice a lot more is how easy it is to di get distracted in in a digital environment than it is in a in-class learning environment yeah, even professionally, there's been so many online conferences and webinars and, and opportunities to engage way more than I would have had regularly. You know, I can maybe go to a conference once a year, and I've, I've had opportunities to do a dozen webinars since March, but I can't focus to save my life. So I really supervise a student, you know, your email's going, and your phone is over here, and there's nobody sort of there to help you self-monitor and pay attention. And the thing I really need to learn, I have to watch it two or three times to really fully absorb it. So I, I can definitely with the situation that students are bringing in. But some people really love it and it works well for them, but it's, it's recognizing all of those different learning styles and, and just personal preferences and trying to create opportunities for people that will meet their needs. Like when I have done instruction this time, if I have to do a video, I also provide all my notes and my slides so somebody doesn't have to watch the video if they don't want to. And just trying to be multimodal and making things as accessible in different ways as possible. I think it's been important, but it's taking a little more time to develop all of this stuff and then ways of doing things. So do you feel like the problem solving skills that students are having to learn as they navigate through COVID, are they sort of going to be long term applicable skills do you feel like? Like is there some advantage to the new norm teaching new strategies? I think it's making all of us a lot more flexible which is great. Um, I remember going in to teach a class and I had the flu and it felt awful, but I didn't have anyone to like, give it to and rescheduling would have been too hard. And it was only a 10 minute presentation and I could have easily just done that online and somebody could have put me up on the screen, right? And I feel a little more comfortable doing something like that now and, and it's less chance of everyone else catching my flu, which I should have been thinking about at the time. Um, but also doing virtual research consultations online, I thought that was going to be really hard and really challenging and there'd be technical 
the difficulties or students are really comfortable doing it. But I've done a ton of them using Google Meet and it's been fine. I can share my screen and walk people through the steps. And so that's really opening up new opportunities for students who maybe don't want to have to come in and meet with me in person, but we can still easily engage in a virtual environment and get the same experience. So yeah, person that's all do it online and explore the tools that we might have been ignoring beforehand, but that we're still able to be available to us. Yeah, there, I find that there's definitely more of an increase in technical skills online, it, uh, at least amongst myself and some of the people I know. It's that with this whole new environment, people are just forcing themselves to learn how to interact with technology in a way they haven't before. Yeah, definitely. The one concern I do have is around equity, though, because not everybody has the internet, not everybody has a laptop, and that's another thing the library's been dealing with is making sure that we have laptops available for term learning for those students who need it or, you know, who don't have the software that will work on their computer. But we definitely just keep having to be responsive to dealing with those sorts of things. Or even we promoting this, the self-checkout app. You know, if we don't have a phone, we don't have a phone that works with the app, we still need to have a self-checkout machine and staff available to help. So lots of advantages, lots of disadvantages. And I'm sure there's students that are struggling with trying to learn these new technologies and um, hopefully they're reaching out and asking for some help with that. Yeah, fingers crossed because that, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> Thank you for touching on the idea of equity and what you just said there. I think that that's so true that there's already so many expenses being associated with being a student to then bring in these kind of new, maybe unexpected tech expenses if you're a first year student. And also just you're already trying to learn so much course material to now have to build your technical skills so suddenly is probably a lot to deal with for any student, but particularly first years. And then faculty members are having to learn how to use Blackboard, which they haven't really, really done before their writers. So yeah. it's really interesting to see that side of things too, and things that we might have taken for granted before. And by figuring out the best approaches, and we're learning how to do our jobs as students and as teachers. Do you find more faculty are approaching you uh, about this? About like about online technologies and stuff, or is it, or it, do they mostly stick to uh, their department? They have an e-learning department, which they have been reaching out to. Some have been reaching out to librarians because there's always sort of this. People don't always understand what librarians do, but that's great. And we've been trying to help them too. But we we definitely do have this e-learning department and staff available that are ready to help and have developed lots of resources. So it has been so critically important in this time to really step up and help guide all of us on how to figure figure all the things out. And so last but then the librarians cut meet every single week and do a little professional development time with each other to share what we've been doing, what's working, what's not working teaching each other new technologies and sharing resources and so even though we're like very isolated and distanced from each other right now we've been finding ways to come together and, and help each other learn all of these new things so again i think it will all benefit us a lot in the long run in terms of our own professional skills and um how we teach in different ways uh, another great thing that we've been doing is we just formed a library leadership group on March 16th, and I'm proud of that, and the timing was so perfect, because <laughs> we brought together, you know, all the managers and coordinators from all different units of the library, and any time there's issues that come up, we can sit and address them, so, you know, when people are having access, having problems with accessing the internet, or having problems accessing laptops, so, you know, we're able to address these really, really quickly. So I do hope that students are bringing forward to their instructors on the library and the issues with access to stuff because we're, we're trying to be responsive, as responsive as we possibly can be and make things as available as we possibly can be. Not that different than the regular times, thankfully, but we just we had to adapt very quickly and even just updating all the information on our website and trying to stay on top of that all summer was a bit nuts because our hours kept changing and you know, contingency planning, what if all the stuff gets sick, what do we do? Like, we're having to work through a lot of scenarios and um, making sure that we can be responsive if things get shut down again and all of that stuff as well. I will say we're having problems with some students not wanting to wear a mask in the library, which I can sympathize with, but uh, <laughs> it's not too bad, but that's been a bit of an ongoing struggle as well. It's just making sure everybody follows all the protocols. Yeah. I can sympathize. <laughs> I wouldn't want to have to sit and write a paper for a few hours with a mask on, but, you know, it's, 
And I remember having like six roommates, and there was no way I was going to get, get any work done at home, and needed to be in the library, and so yeah, we're having to be a little more flexible. Oh, I think we've just about covered everything that we had on the... Is there anything else you want to talk about, Robin? Uh, before we sign off from that? Um, I think it was just my general advice to students right now is to explore everything that's available to you through our website because there's a tons of information on there and you know, some of it's varied, but I mean, there's, there's research help in different ways, there's writing help in a bunch of different varieties as well. We just got a product called Grammarly, which does a pretty awesome job of doing a uh, spell check and grammar check on written work in addition to having a staff and others who can help you with your writing. Um, all of the resources that we have available through databases, encyclopedias, the book content accuracy, and articles as well. Um, but yeah, just exploring all of that stuff and reaching out and asking for help when needed. There's tons of programs just out the ready <laughs> wanting to help everybody that we can. Um, so don't be shy, even though it's in this kind of weird environment. And one thing I thought might be interesting I wanted to tell you about that you may not know about that could work in across disciplines is something called hypothesis, which is spelled like hypothesis. Period and it actually lets you mark up and annotate um, websites and online documents. So if anybody who really prefers how to copy and likes to mark things up and how to do all of that sort of thing, that's just one kind of free online add-on that you can put into your browser that I think can really help people that are trying to work online who are used to printing things out or having that hard copy and marking it up and keeping track of it that way. But yeah, there's lots of these little tools out there and uh, just ask us. We're happy to help you if you're having trouble navigating, studying, collecting your research, citing it, whatever it might be. That's awesome. Like, thank you for that because that that's definitely a useful tool that I know that a lot of our listeners would probably appreciate having. I know I will probably use that. Yeah, I think we could probably even put a link to download the Hypothesis web browser extension into the description of this episode if our listeners want to check it out. <laughs> Shout out to my hypothesis. I just thought there's these little tools. We, we also promote things like citation managers where you can actually store your citations but also copies of the articles that can then generate a reference list. Like, there's just so many online tools I don't think we do a good enough job of promoting. So I did want to make sure to mention them today because there's, um, there's so many things that can make it a little easier for you as you're going along. Other than that, yeah, get to know your instructors, get to know your librarians, and, and don't be shy about asking for any sort of Thank you so much, Robin, for coming and speaking with us, letting us interview you, and for all the great information you shared. I think it's going to be really useful to our listeners to know about some of the things you mentioned, and just to kind of have a better understanding of what's going on with the McEwen Library during COVID. Also, thank you for being our very first interview ever. Um, it was awesome. Yes, thank you. We really appreciate it. No, thank you. Good on you guys. I hope this is okay as your first go. <laughs> I think it's great that you're doing this, and um, you're very good for putting yourselves out there. So I look forward to this. All right, thank you. All right, have a nice day. Me too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, that was our interview with Robin Hall of the McEwen Library. Next up, we're going to play for you the recording of us interviewing Val McLean also of the McEwen Library. She specializes in archivism and in humanities, histories, classics, philosophy, and languages uh, at the McEwen Library. I will again caution listeners, uh, please, please brace yourselves against the whiplash-inducing learning curve you're going to hear the evidence of in my recording skills between these two segments. Well, thank you so much for meeting with us, Val, and letting us interview you on kind of library yes, and you. archivism in uh, COVID. Did you want to <laughs> start, or do you want us to ask you the questions? Do you want this to be more formal or more conversational? Uh, yeah, I mean, it can be conversational as, as well. as I, I'm assuming your listeners know who I am and, and what I do at McEwen. Do you, do you want me to start with that? Or? Yeah, yeah, maybe start with that, please. That would be great. Sure. Um, so I am Vala. I am the university archivist, as well as the history, philosophy, classics, and languages librarian. I also am a sessional faculty member. I teach library and information technology students 
Right now I'm teaching them records management and in the winter term I'll be teaching them a course on archives and I've been at McEwen uh, almost 15 years. Wow, awesome. Yeah, and how do you how do you like McEwen? I'm fortunate that I love what I do for a living. Um, it took me a long time to figure out what I was going to be when I grew up. I thought I'd be an actress for a while. I thought I'd be a fashion designer. <laughs> And uh, by the time I got around to deciding I wanted to be a, an archivist, I didn't have an undergrad. So I thought, well, what do I love? I love history. So I got an undergrad in history, and then I did a master's in archival studies, and uh, also decided to do my master's in library and information studies at the same time. So UBC has a program where you can do both master's degrees at the same time. So I did that. So I, I do feel fortunate that I you know, 15 plus years in, I, I love what I do for a living. That's awesome. It's very awesome. And you still love it even during COVID, I guess would be my question. <laughs> and all the things that come with that. Yeah, so I mean, you know, the anxiety around COVID aside, I love working from home. I've always loved working from home. Um, I'm very much an introvert. So, um, so yeah, you so you know, it, and in a cold day like today, I don't have to walk outside on slippery sidewalks to get to work. So uh, you know, I'm definitely trying to focus on the positives of of, of working from home. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's okay. Yeah, good to hear. That's good. It's good to see the positives in all of this. I'm definitely not missing trekking out to McEwen every single day. Yeah. In the middle of the the winter. Yeah. Um. So you like working from home and that's really exciting to hear, I guess, that it's not been taxing that way. Are you finding professional challenges with adapting to at home? I, yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest professional challenge for me is that I'm not in the classroom. So one of the things I love about my job is teaching research literacy to history, philosophy, and classic students. And, you know, I can teach in an academic year anywhere from 30 to 40 classes. Um, so I do miss, you know, walking into that classroom um, and connecting with students. What I love about McEwen is it's still a small enough campus that there aren't a lot of layers between a librarian and a student. Um, so I run into students when I'm going to get coffee. Um, I collaborate with faculty. So I really, that's probably the biggest challenge for me is that I just don't um, get to walk into a classroom anymore. Yeah. You, you use the phrase research literacy, which um, I guess ties really well into what we really want to ask you about, which is digital research literacy. And how does that work? I think Vic and I both feel comfortable saying as history majors that history majors aren't always the most techie people. So how are you, what's that like right now? Yeah, I mean, um, certainly in the humanities, that's a discipline that has been slow to embrace ebook. If you look at even in classics, some of the, um, you know, portals for digital content are honestly very poorly designed. <laughs> Compared oh, to yeah. <laughs> I come across them like, oh, they need some help figuring out how to put this online. Um, and even when it comes to collection development, I'm always advocating for purchasing print materials instead of e-resources. So, of course, right now that's all changed and I'm being discouraged to buy print materials or only print materials when that's all that's available. That, that said, I mean, I've, I've been around long enough that there's definitely a, a shift. And, and I think, so the biggest shift I've seen is in primary sources. When I was an undergrad in history, if you wanted to do research you, on primary resources, you had to physically go to that archives. You had to go to that brick and mortar shop. Um, and since I've become a librarian, that shift has is, is just been huge. So now not only do we have incredible databases that provide access to primary sources for students that are subscriptions, so we pay big bucks for them, but there's a phenomenal amount of open access resources out there for students. I think one of the biggest issues for students is there is a overwhelming amount of information out there. <laughs> if I think back to when I was an undergrad in history, 
the internet didn't exist. So I had to physically go into the library. I had to use, you know, uh, be in the stacks. And I, I just think there's, it's, it's overwhelming. And, and um, I do worry sometimes that students get fixated in a particular digital resource. So maybe they only do all the research in JSTOR, or maybe they do all only all of the research in Google or a particular database or in our library catalog. And I always try to encourage students or make them aware that each of those resources, there's pros and cons to using them. And they do really have to try to, you know, dip into each of them to make sure that they're finding uh, relevant material. Awesome. Yeah. And do you see that students are picking up new skills for researching now that uh, now that we've moved to this uh, digital environment? Or do you, and do we, are we seeing a little bit more issues of plagiarism? Sure. I mean, I, I think the big buzzword around universities right now is plagiarism to the, um, I think it's called contract cheating, in which there is organizations, people, software out there who will write your paper for you <laughs> and, and submit and you can submit their work. So I, I think that's a, a huge concern. Um, and not so much try, tied to research, but proctoring exams. So how do students write online exams? There's been lots of controversy around forcing students to have their camera on while they write their exam. And of course, it's all it's all colored in the world that we live in right now with COVID, right? It, 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 it's hard to do in-depth research. It's, it's hard to engage in your topic when there's just so much unknown uh, around us right now. Um, you know, as much as history students and, uh, rely more on print resources, I mean, e-journals are a good example, I think, where um, the humanities have embraced that as opposed to e-books because, um, I, I, you know, I, I hear less grumbling among faculty and students when it comes to having access to e-journals. E-books are, are still uh, a bit of a, an issue. Um, yeah, and so I think always one of the pieces that is still difficult is to evaluate resources and to make sure that they're they're credible to use right to really bring those um critical thinking school skills I, you know again everybody's exhausted we're, we're anxious we're we don't really want to be where we are um and so in that case it is much easier just to sort of um copy and paste and, and hand it in and, and run away mm -hmm. with it yeah because that's one of the things I was thinking about the most is like, how will the fact that we're all at home and we're all a little bit stressed is like, uh, how are uh, specifically like first years, if they're dealing with that, how are they gonna deal with that yeah. situation? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's so unfortunate to be a first year, right? You think of all the things you're missing out on by not being physically on campus. It's just, it, it must be incredibly isolating. You don't know your classmates. You don't know your faculty. Um, you don't know your professors. My sister is a first year at uh, at another university, and she's saying it's yeah so hard. Yeah. And, you know, to be, to be fair, you, you know, you're, you're talking about students' digital skills. Um, not all faculty are really good with Blackboard. And oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we were in a just a I mean, we had a blitz this summer, you know, lots of PD opportunities to flip your course online. But, you know, let, let's face it, some faculty are struggling with <laughs> the online world. You know. And I guess with that side, Bella, do you feel like that transition is going well? Like, are you having opportunities to support staff members? Are you seeing those sorts of opportunities out there? Or is it more, like, is it less formal? Is it more just kind of colleagues learning skills from each other rather than a professional development plan? No, so it, it's, it's we have a fantastic office of um, teaching and learning at McEwen, and over the summer, their staff just did a fantastic job of developing tutorials, uh, workshops, um, you know, best practices for teaching online. So I, you know, I definitely feel very supported. Um, I did, I've been an online student as well. I did a post-master certificate out of San Jose, San Jose State University's um, iSchool. I did a post-master certificate in uh, digital archives and records management. So that was all online. So I feel, um, 
you know, I know what it's like to be an online student. So, uh, you know, I'm bringing a lot of those lessons learned as well in, in, into what I do. Very cool. And I mean, obviously we're talking at the undergraduate level, but are you, career-wise, are you kind of more mindful to teaching these digital skills as the future? Or is this more of a temporary thing in your mind? That's a good question. I. I mean, more and more content is going to be made available online. So, you know, having savvy database skills is, is you know, it, it's not new. I mean, I've been teaching it for many years, right? Um, the tutorials that I've been developing for history and classic students this time around um, are, are, are more some of the quirks that might disappear in the future. So I'll give you an example. Um, the University of Alberta signed in an agreement with Hattie Trust, which is a, an online digital library in the States. And the agreement was that um, U of A students, faculty and staff can have access to all these wonderful e-resources, but that their print copies, if they have a print copy and there's a digital copy that exists, the print copy can't circulate. So I'm finding increasingly when I'm helping history students, they're coming across books that say restricted access. So there's a print copy of a book that a student wants for an upper level course, and it, it will not circulate. So I'm, uh, so I'm tweaking some of the, the, the instruction that I'm doing to account for that. Now, once COVID's over and we can all, you know, go en masse back to the library, that sort of thing won't be uh, necessary to teach. That said, going back to what I said about, you know, not relying on one place to find all of your content for your history or classics or philosophy paper, right? So just because Hattie Trust has a digital copy of this book doesn't mean you can't sleuth around and, and see if there's other ways to get access to that material. One of the things that we talked about with Robin is uh, sort of favorite things, like favorite sort of technologies that have become useful for not only students, but for faculty members during this time. Do you have a favorite? I love, love Screencast-O-Matic. <laughs> so it's how I record all of my tutorials. Um, it, yeah, everything, both for the history and classic classes and for my library and information technology students. It's so easy. It's cheap. Yeah, so any kind of, you know, creation of, um, you know, webinars or tutorials. I've just fallen in love with Screencast-O-Matic. Um, mm -hmm. I've also, I've, I mean, I've, I've been a huge user of the Internet Archive, so that's not new, but they've really thrown in, you know, done much more digitization. There's more content. They've opened it up. Um, they have a lending library, so you'll find those resources if you do a search in Internet Archive, but the lending library is pretty cool because what they're doing is they are you know, libraries are, are feeling under pressure to get rid of print resources to make more study spaces for students. Um, so instead of those print books being just, you know, recycled, they're being digitized. And the Lending Library project's really cool because you can go in and you can sign out a book for an hour. You just create a free account in the Internet Archive Lending Library. And I have found a lot, a lot of resources for history students that route. So um, even though Internet Archive's not new, definitely relying on it more yeah. that's that's great i think that students are well the people who listen to our podcast will probably find that yeah. very useful we they will probably find a link in the description if they click down there <laughs> <laughs> and i think we sort of covered how what in innovations do you think this will lead to practice in the field of archiving so i'm not going to ask that <laughs> uh is there any expectations that the situation will allow for archival material to be made more readily available to not not just the academics but like to the public say like for i don't know if our casual listeners might be interested in doing some yeah i mean a, a couple of things that i might i mean i don't know how much ex you know experience either of you have in archives or know much about archives so i, I just want to take a step back and, and point out um one of the things about archives is they are chronically underfunded. They are short staff. Um, you know, if we just want to go local, if we look at what's happening, happening in the province um, with the budget cuts, I see universities suspending their archival, buying their archivists and, and, and closing down their archives. 
but this is not new. <laughs> um, so the question about, I don't necessarily, it's not that archivists don't want to digitize content, it's that they have backlogs, they're chronically underfunded. Um, you also have to be wary of copyright and access law, yeah. you know, so it isn't just a matter of digitizing everything and putting it freely available on, on the web. Um, that said, you know, um, I, I think archivists and archives staff are, you know, in this situation where many of them are being encouraged to work from home, are thinking about what does that future look like and, and how, what do we need to do to make more of our content available, not only to um, people who want to use in archives, but to staff so they can do some of their work from home, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, digitization, um, putting content available on the web um, is definitely a priority of archives. It, it may increase in the future, but it's going to be have to be balanced with the fact that um, we're underfunded <laughs> and it doesn't yeah. look rosy for archives in, in Alberta. Yeah, it's, it's such a shame because I remember reading about that and I was like, there's so much important work that's being done. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just thought it was such a shame when I heard about that. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess it's kind of following the theme that we've already talked about. Um, you talked a lot about how students are adapting to more digital sources and how you're being discouraged from kind of going with your print and being asked to seek out digital more. Um, and we spoke to Robin Hall, who's your colleague in sociology, of course. Um, and she talked about how there is already a big push for more digital sources among kind of the sociological and the gender studies materials. Do you think that the new normal is going to stay? Like, do you think that now that you've been asked to seek out more digital, you'll continue to be asked to seek out more digital? Yeah, y yes and no. So my desire, my interest in, um, or, you know, sometimes my fight to put print books on the shelves in the McEwen Library, um, that's certainly my, my preference when it comes to ebooks, but that that's the discipline as a whole, right? That that's bigger than me. So so that's okay. the discipline of history and classics, very much still rooted in the print, the, the actual you know text. Um, mm -hmm. You know, will that that shift? Yes. I mean, I you know, are we going to? You know, we're not like I don't think we're going to. I mean, already business students primarily use e-journals, right? I mean, it's not uncommon for me to make small talk with a business student as I'm helping them find a book on the second floor, and then telling me they're in their final year of their business degree and they've never been in the library before. You know? So, I, you know, I don't. We're not going to jump to that anytime soon. But um, yeah. Absolutely, um, you know, and, and more open access resources. Well, there's room for all of us in the world, but I, I prefer books. <laughs> <That's awesome>. As do I. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much, Fala. Is there anything else you want to say? Because we feel like you've really covered a lot so far. It's kind of hard mm -hmm. to ask you more questions without sort of going in a loop. I guess all that I would suggest is, is, you know, as much as I love my job, so many people do at McEwen. Um, you've already, you know, spoken to some of my colleagues, and I have some of the best colleagues I've ever worked with. They are just so committed to students, so committed to student success. Um, so if students are struggling um, and, and, you know, need help finding sources or need help, how, you know, trying to figure out even where to begin, how to put it, put together a search strategy, um, please reach out to us. You know, we, we do, um, you know, we're not your primary faculty member, we're not your professor, um, but um, we very much are committed to your success. And, and, you know, because we love what we do for a living, I, I just think it makes us overly enthusiastic to help out. So, um, yeah, I guess that I'll, I'll end it there. Awesome, Wonderful. thank you. Um, and uh, normally when we have a guest who's a McEwen faculty member, because we have so many McEwen students listening, is it all right with you if we put your email in the description or the episode notes? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Absolutely. Okay. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much for yeah. taking the time this morning, especially first thing in the morning on the Monday <laughs> of reading week. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> right now, so it's all. Good. It was lovely meeting both you and and uh, this is great work you're doing. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you as well. Yeah. Okay. Have a great week. <laughs> as well. Those were two awesome interviews. Um, that was great. It was super interesting to see just how different um, Robin's responses and Vala's kind of perspective on things were. Yeah, it was. I noticed that with Robin, we had a bit more discussion about like the COVID protocols and how that has affected working in a library and also student life. And Vala really discussed more about all the uh, work that's been doing with archives and all that, which makes sense because she does more of that work. Yeah, um, I think they were a really good kind of pairing for us as, you know, in a, a podcast that wants to look at interdisciplinary um, sort of experiences, because they are both McEwen librarians, they are both people who are specialized to specific disciplines in McEwen libraries. And the fact that they have such a different perspective on the permanency of um, kind of this digital world we're living in now that COVID has happened, uh, it's very, very interesting. Yeah, I think the fact that we were talking to multiple librarians and um, in part two of this sort of series that we're doing, we're going to have more discussions with librarians from McEwen. We're going to have a really broad picture of what it's like to be working in this sort of environment during the COVID era. Yeah, it was very, very interesting to hear also about the difference in kind of preference between a digital material versus a physical material. Yeah, um, very interesting. I also really love the fact that you talked about um, sort of the challenges that the professionals are dealing and the fact that there are those supports available. Yes, I I really like that, especially because we're gonna, we will probably have some professors listening to this and I think it's good to that people are, know that they're also getting that sort of support. Yeah, it's interesting because I don't feel like at any point um, either of them was saying one thing and the other person was saying the complete opposite. But there was definitely some differences uh, between the disciplines, and I think it's, I think the fact that they gave different answers, and also that um, the workshops that were being done, and the fact that faculty are relying off of each other, I think that that hits sort of the underlying belief that you and I have, and the thing that's got us investigating what we are in this podcast, um, being that the disciplines can learn a lot through each other's practices and through being exposed to each other. Yeah, it does. And like you said, there it's really cool to see how the interdisciplinary perspective can be put on just about anything, including things that people don't necessarily think about because we, uh, we first came up with this concept for the uh, episode series. We were thinking maybe one or two librarians, and that would be uh, sort of a cool juxtaposition to have against with the professor that we're going to talk to later, uh, Professor Hannon. And I think it's so valuable that we're talking to four librarians because we're getting such a broad interdisciplinary picture. Like, when we, we're going to these subject librarians, they're giving us their own perspectives on what it's like within the discipline, not only as for learning, but also for making that learning accessible. Yeah, and I think that's the thing to, to kind of keep in mind is these librarians we're talking to, library science, information management, to use the language of McEwen, is a discipline in its own right. The way that we mm -hmm. curate information for people to have access to it is an academic discipline in its own right. Um, we could have gained so much just from Vala, who is a history librarian, telling us about the library science side of things. But the fact that the wonderful McEwen library faculty have, so many of them have agreed to speak to us, I think really offers a lot to our listeners. It does, and it, it's a very rich resource, I think, to have, to have this these conversations and have them recorded for future posterity. Like, not only is this podcast just fun for us, and I hope fun for our listeners, but I think also for the future. I think it's going to be very important to have these perspectives that I don't think people are going to be hearing about as much in the future. I think they'll be hearing more about, like, other subsections of this moment in history, because 2020 is such a big historical moment. I, 
I mean, the past couple of days alone, Sloane, you and I have yeah. talked about it. It's crazy. Yeah. We, yes. <laughs> um, anyway, twenty twenty. Um, but <laughs> but I think the other thing that is really significant is you know Val made the point of students actually have a lot of direct asset access to their librarians and the q and It can still be nerve-wracking to approach someone who you're not introduced to in a, even in a professional setting, but also just getting this kind of window into what their side of things looks like, whether that's book acquisition, whether that's the way they're being digitized, the availability of digital sources, the kind of barriers to that, mm. I think, is really fascinating. I think so as well, and I think it's interesting to hear about how certain resources that are available to students, they vary ac across disciplines. Yeah. Because with Robin, we were talking about more of like the online open access and the sort of digital formats they're, they're in. And then we've also got Vala, who is talking about the how his, the history and humanities departments tend to go and stick to the, the physical book, how she encourages the physical book. Which, mm -hmm. I mean, you and I are both people who like a heavy backpack. Um, we do like a heavy backpack. I have broken a strap. On a backpack, <laughs> um, or I suppose it was a messenger bag, but uh, yeah. Any final yeah. thoughts? Yeah. Well, uh, continuing what I was thinking earlier, I, I think that this will be a good primary source to have. That the these episodes—they're not only just a picture of like student life and life of a fac life of faculty during 2020, but also it's like it's just a cool primary source for say in like 40 years when they're looking back to the McEwen's archives and they say oh look at this little podcast that they have recorded here what is what is this yeah mm -hmm. thank you again to Val McLean and Robin Hall of the McEwen yes Library thank you very Faculty. much before we sign off Sloan and I would like to acknowledge that McEwen University this podcast and all the content we create are located and produced on Treaty 6 territory this land has traditionally and continues to be a home, place of gathering, and meeting ground for many Indigenous peoples. This includes the Nakota Sioux, Nitsitapi, Métis, Salto, and Cree First Nations. You can find our podcast on all of your favorite podcast directories and on YouTube. You can find us on Twitter, at hist.mac, Instagram, which is at history at Mac or on Facebook under the name of the Interdisciplinary History Group at McEwen. We will leave links to these social media pages and our blog in the description box of your favorite podcast directory. If you would like to be a guest, or have a suggestion for a future episode or blog post topic, please let us, please let us know by shooting an email to interdisciplinaryhistgroupmu at gmail.com. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. Stay tuned for our next recording. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Stay safe. Wear a mask. And has it been challenging to offer the same level of research help and support because you're being kind of limited by the digital necessities of COVID?